Welcome to all of you to the Iowa City Foreign Relations Council program featuring our guest speaker, Ambassador Ron McMullen. Uh, we thank him and all of you for joining us uh, in person as well as uh, live streaming today. My name is Peter Gerlach. I am ICFRC's Executive Director and I also teach in the International Studies program at the university. I am thrilled to be with you in this very space, uh, which, as many of you know already, is ICFRC's new home for programs. Yes. That means that we'll be doing probably about 90% of our programs right here, welcoming speakers who are standing here with us and those who will join us from places around the planet. And we can, as an audience, join here in the room together, building community, and welcome people uh, who join us via Zoom or live stream. So we're coming to everybody in lots of different ways. And we hope to see uh, all of you here at the library in the coming months and years. This year, we are celebrating ICFRC's 40th anniversary. How about that? We can drive, we can vote. Uh, you know, we're thinking about having kids. I don't know. We're feeling good about life. Uh, we have some great plans this year with a total of four anniversary events beginning today devoted to celebrating our supporters, folks just like all of you. Our legacy in the community and the bright future ahead for internationally focused programming. And we hope that you will check out our website, sign up for our monthly newsletters, and follow us on social media to learn more about the exciting stuff happening this year. For today's program, uh, we would ask a few things. Uh, if you are new to ICFRC or our programs, we'd ask that you take a moment to sign in. Uh, there are some forms right at the table uh, where the amazing Lexi and the amazing Sahithi, our interns uh, for this year, are seated, our fabulous welcomers. I hope you take a moment to ask them about all the brilliant things they are doing on campus and the even more brilliant things they're going to do in their futures ahead. Uh, second, we are trying to be really intentional about this one. So um, if you have a, a program idea or a speaker suggestion, we want to know what those are. We are very um, intentional as a community organization to bring programs that interest all of you. So we want your ideas. I might even tug at your elbow today to see if you've got some good ones. And you can reach us uh, any number of ways. Let us know what you'd like to learn about and how you'd like to engage in internationally focused programming. Uh, finally, if you would like to make a contribution to our great organization, there are signs around the room with a QR code. If you like blasting it open with your phone, you can do that. Uh, of course, you can talk to myself uh, or any of our amazing board members uh, in the room about how to contribute to the organization. I'd like to take a moment then to recognize our amazing board of directors. You wonderful people, will you please stand up? Let's give them a round of applause, ICFRC's board. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. ICFRC is successful, and we have been for 40 years because of folks just like you. So ICFRC wants to acknowledge and thank our annual donors, sponsors, and partners for their support. This list that we cannot forget to disclude, the Iowa Arts Council through the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, Humanities Iowa and the National Endowment for the Humanities, the University of Iowa's International Programs, Honors Program and Public Policy Center, the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, Midwest One Bank, Taxes Plus, City Channel 4 for providing online access to our programs along with the UI Library Archives, and last, but certainly not least, um, the longstanding support from individuals who have helped our organization grow for 40 years. Many of you are in the audience today. And of course, our new home for programs, the Iowa City Public Library. 
ICFRC adopted the Native American Land Acknowledgement prepared for the City of Iowa City's Ad Hoc Truth and Reconciliation Commission and Human Rights Commission. ICFRC recognizes that our home community of Iowa City now occupies the homelands of Native American nations to whom we owe our commitment and dedication. The full text of ICFRC's acknowledgement is on our website at icfrc.org. Okay, I would now like to introduce you all to our speaker for today. Ron McMullen previously served as U.S. Ambassador to the state of Eritrea. A former career diplomat, he has over 30 years of global experience and has lived, worked, or traveled in 117 countries. I got thrown out of Serbia in August, so 118, I guess. 118, okay. <laughs> 117 and a half? <laughs> um, in Burma, he worked closely with pro-democracy groups and beleaguered ethnic minorities. While posted in Fiji, he helped prevent civil conflict after an armed takeover of parliament. He was shot at during a riot in Sri Lanka and helped train mongooses to detect heroin. He survived a voodoo curse in the Dominican Republic and took Hillary Clinton on a tour of South Africa's Robben Island with Nelson Mandela. Between foreign assignments, Ambassador McMullen taught for three years at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and later served as diplomat in residence at the University of Texas at Austin. He has authored a number of scholarly works and is a three-time recipient of the State Department's Superior Honor Award. Since joining the University of Iowa's faculty in 2012, he has received the Honors Program Teaching Award a Collegiate Teaching Award from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and the Iowa Scholar Advocate Award. He is the author of the chapter United States Diplomatic Service in the book Modern Diplomacy in Practice. A native of Northwood, Iowa, and a graduate of Drake University, he earned his doctorate in political science from the University of Iowa. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in joining our speaker, Ron McMullen, who will talk about world order and the South Caucasus. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, great to see so many familiar faces. As I said, it seems like we should be in the basement of the Congregational Church, but I'm really glad we're here. Much better uh, facilities and, uh, and Wi-Fi people tell me as well. So I just wanted to say that, you know, I started off my semester teaching uh, by passing around a jar of $109 and told students guess how much is in this. And if you are from Chicago and paying the increased full sticker price for tuition, that's what every single one of my lectures, my classes cost you. So you're getting that for free. So you're getting not only a free lunch, but $109 worth of free international relations that you don't have to pay a high out-of-state tuition to here. Um, I'd like to start off by saying I really don't know very much about the topic that I'm going to speak about. We have some real experts here that know a lot more about the South, South Caucasus, for example, than I do. So um, I will have sort of uh, very shallow experience here, but um, be glad to share some observations and insights. And, Maybe if we have some really hard questions uh, afterwards that people in the audience can help me answer those if, uh, if that's a possibility. So I'd like you to think about uh, 40 years ago. If we got into a time machine and went back 40 years when ICFRC was just getting started, the world was different. 1983. Uh, Jane and I had just gotten married. We were off to our first assignment in the Dominican Republic. And you think, oh, two years at a Club Med, or three years at a Club Med, not bad. Well, the Dominican Republic 40 years ago was in kind of the cauldron of the Cold War. If we think about American foreign policy, American foreign relations, the world order 40 years ago, we were in the depths of the Cold War. So in our, the neighborhood of the Dominican Republic where where Jane and I lived, well, on my first uh, assignment as a U.S. diplomat, um, on the western edge of the Caribbean, we had uh, uh, the Sandinistas, a Marxist, Soviet-supported communist government in, in Nicaragua. Um, the United States was ginning up uh, 
a rebel group called the Contras, Contra revolutionaries, to overthrow them. Guatemala was in the depths of a horrible, horrible civil war, support, uh, uh, pitting communist guerrillas supported by Cuba and the Soviet Union against an American support, American backed dictatorship. The same in El Salvador. Um, Cuba had 50,000 combat troops fighting in Angola, supported by the Soviet Union. Um, they had, were building an extended airstrip in the little country of Grenada to be able to transport more troops to uh, southern Africa and to supply them when there was a Marxist coup in Grenada. And the big news from 1973, 1983, besides ICFRC's founding, was the U.S. invasion of Grenada. We won. We won that one. Uh, so 7,000 American troops invaded this little tiny Caribbean country. There had been a coup, kind of a Marxoid prime minister had been killed and overthrown by a more radical uh, communist uh, uh, ruler. And suddenly it looked like there was a lot of instability on the island, and there were 650 U.S. medical students who couldn't get into the University of Iowa Medical School, and as their plan B, C, or D went to Grenada to a medical school there. And so the invasion was ostensibly to rescue the American medical students, uh, which we did, also fought against the Cubans and Grenadian uh, communist uh, forces. Um, 19 Americans were killed, um, about a dozen, excuse me, uh, several scores of uh, Cuban troops. This was 1983, depths of the Cold War. So until uh, for the next eight years or so, the United States, the, the question of world order was pretty clear. It was the American-led West, the democratic countries, the free, the free world against the Soviet-led communist bloc. China was kind of marching to its own uh, tune at that point after the split with the Soviet Union that happened uh, sometime previously. But in general, the Cold War made American foreign policy uh, quite clear, the bipolar Cold War. American politics ended at, at the water's edge. Republicans, Democrats were against communism. We were for the spread of democracy um, and the international uh, order that that Cold War generated. So if we think about, if we, if we go to Christmas Day of 1991, uh, President Gorbachev of the Soviet Union dissolved the Soviet Union Surprised everybody, maybe Bill Reisinger saw it coming. Uh, I didn't, uh, I uh, was as surprised as lots of people were. When the Soviet Union peacefully dissolved itself into 15 independent countries. And at that point, political scientists all over the world were doing what I called the, the, the world order formula. Two minus one equals what? And if you had a, a Cold War system with two powers, two poles, and suddenly one went away, what do you have? So I'm not very good in math. That's why I became a political scientist. I would have been a geologist if I could have done hard science in college. I couldn't. But even for me, that's pretty basic. Two minus one equals one. And so people thought that maybe the international system was going to have a unipolar character, where there was one powerful country that would uh, enforce and uphold the rules of the, of the game of the international system. And this was sort of enforced or reinforced by an article written by a young academic who had, had for a while had worked in the State Department as a political appointee named Francis Fukuyama. Francis Fukuyama wrote a short article that he turned into a longer book called The End of History. And he wrote this as the Berlin Wall fell in 1989. And he said, if you look back at the history of the 20th century, it was a, there were a series of conflicts based on ideology. America and its allies defeated fascism in World War II, in Italy and Japan and Germany. And uh, now that the Cold War is coming to an end, it, it appears that the United States has also defeated uh, Marxism, communism, as an ideology. So he wrote uh, this, this article, uh, The End of History, um, that alienated all kinds of historians. Uh, but uh, his argument was 
that now because uh, capitalist democracy has vanquished all foes, we can all aspire to a peaceful, cooperative, maybe economically competitive world order where there will be little or no conflict um, between great powers based on ideology. And that was a pretty happy moment. I mean, A, the Cold War had ended. We were enjoying what was called, you know, the, the, cold, the, the peace dividend, the State Department downsized, the Defense Department downsized. Things were changing rapidly. And so uh, also about that time, uh, a guy who taught at uh, Harvard um, read Francis Fukuyama's article, and his, his name was Sam Huntington. Um, and Huntington said, I don't think uh, Frank's got this right. And he wrote sort of a counterpoint to that. And uh, it was an article, again, that he later turned into a book called The Clash of Civilizations. Huntington argued that world order after the Cold War will not be sort of a unipolar moment where there's no ideological conflict or conflict will there be economic cooperation. But Huntington argued that there will be conflict not based on ideology, but between states that align on civilizational grounds. And he identified about eight major civilizations um, somewhat related to geography and religion um, and said that in the future, conflict will happen between great powers based on civilizational values and, and ties. Nobody believed Huntington. He, he, they said, you've missed the boat. Uh, the Cold War's over. We are, we are home free. And so for about a decade from Christmas Day of 91 until September 11, 2001, Francis Fukuyama got a lot of traction from his article that he turned into a book. And on September 11, 2001, when the United States suffered the greatest attack, most deadly attack in the history of our country by a foreign power on our country, people thought, why do they hate us? What is Al-Qaeda up to? Why do they hate us? And people got out Huntington's uh, article about the clash of civilizations and said, hmm, maybe two minus one equals seven or eight. Maybe there will be conflict based on civilizational values in the future. So for maybe 10 years, two minus one equaled one. And in the 10 years, I would argue, between the attacks on the United States and when we killed Osama bin Laden, or maybe when we defeated uh, um, Islamic State in the Battle of Mosul in 2017, but let's just say to keep it for a decade, that there was um, a lot of attention paid to civilizational conflict and Huntington's article. So for a while then, it looked like two minus one equals seven or eight, possibly. Um, and then uh, as the United States elected uh, Donald Trump in 2016, President Trump had a very, very unusual uh, foreign policy approach. It was transactional, that I will do this if you do that. And if you don't do this, I won't do that. So suddenly it looked like there may be no pole, no hegemon that would be willing to do what needed to be done to maintain a world system. Uh, and so President Trump, his transactional foreign policy uh, made it look like maybe there was that two minus one equaled zero. Maybe we're going to have no great power, no hegemon or pole that would help maintain uh, a coherent international system. Talked about, you know, if you don't pay 2%, NATO members, if you don't pay two per, your 2% of your GDP into defense, maybe, and, and you ring the uh, 911 um, Article 5 or Chapter 5 element of NATO, we might not come rescue you if you don't do enough on your own. So for a while, particularly in places like Europe and among our NATO allies, it looked like 2 minus 1 equals 0 uh, for a while during sort of the, uh, the Trump administration. In the Biden administration, I would say that many of Biden's foreign policy thinkers and um, implementers uh, used to believe in convergence, that uh, if we let China lie, cheat, and steal until it got richer, then China would do less of that and be more of a normal country and would 
be a better neighbor and member of the international community. So we thought that eventually China, as it got richer, would converge with other acceptable international behavior and, be, and do less of all the bad things that we dislike China for doing during uh, the early part of its rise. But in 2012, when Xi Jinping became the head of uh, the Iowa Connected, Xi Jinping became the power in China, uh, it became pretty evident early on that convergence wasn't going to happen. And I would argue that most of President Biden's uh, senior foreign policy advisors would argue that two minus one equals two, and those two are the United States and China. So I, I often will go through this little two minus one equals what equation in my comparative politics classes, because there's a lot of confusion out there. Um, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine last February added further to the, to the sort of rattle in the under, our understanding of what world order is all about. So I'm not sure that even uh, 30 years now, almost after uh, Gorbachev dissolved the Soviet Union, that there's any great um, sort of unanimity about that, the answer to that very basic equation of what two minus one equals. When Putin and Xi Jinping get together, they always talk about uh, supporting a multipolar world. Uh, but beyond China, uh, Russia hardly counts. It's sort of a, a gas station with nukes, right, as, as some people have, have called it. So there's nobody that aspires to be like Russia, I don't think. Um, so we shall see. Um, and one place that might help us understand some of the unusual relationships that are happening around the world now that there's no longer, we're no longer in the bipolar Cold War system is the South Caucasus, three countries, three little countries sort of stuck between Asia and Europe that have, uh, are very interesting, beautiful countries full of wonderful people with great food and interesting histories and cultures. Um, two of the three are at odds with each other and lots of them have, and all of them have uh, kind of surprising links to the outside world um, in, their, uh, in their foreign relations that, that reinforce what's happening in these countries. So uh, when Peter asked uh, if I'd be willing to um, talk to folks at ICFRC, I had just come back from seeing the world's uh, cutest toddler, our grandson who lives in Tbilisi, Georgia. And so Peter said, what do you want to talk about? I said, well, world order, maybe in the, in the South Caucasus. So I don't really know much about the South, South Caucasus. Um, Jane and I have been there a couple of times. Um, and you'll see some, I'm going to subject you to some of our own photos here in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but I thought the South Caucasus region helps illustrate sort of the, the ongoing transformation of world order you know, from a clear-cut bipolar Cold War system into something that's that's messier, that maybe will be um, seen as transitional coalitions of countries grouping together uh, around certain issues rather than long-term alliances like we saw during the Cold War. So let's look at these three countries and see what they might reveal to us about what world order might is like now, kind of, and what might be coming down the road uh, in the future. So here are three countries, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia. They are um, all former republics of the Soviet Union. Uh, during, um, during the change from the Russian Empire to the Soviet Union, they all broke away, and there was lots of chaos and confusion in this region. Um, uh, and they all declared independence uh, briefly until the Soviets were able to reimpose their order. And they're somewhat distinct because of um, the Caucasus Mountains that sort of are run along the, the border here of uh, uh, Russia. The tallest mountain in uh, Europe. Mount Elbus, 19,000 feet, is just here in the, in the greater Caucasus range. And so for Russia, uh, this, this area was considered the Trans-Caucasia, across the Caucasus Mountains, um, which is kind of a Soviet and Russian perspective. But the tall mountains here, there are also the lesser Caucasus that run down this way. 
make the area somewhat isolated and, um, and somewhat broken up. We'll see uh, a little bit more about the ethnic heterogeneity, uh, heterogeneity of, the, of these three countries uh, in a few minutes. So this area between uh, Europe and Asia has been uh, invaded and occupied and, uh, for thousands and thousands of years. Almost every great power, uh, the, the Greeks, the Romans, uh, the Byzantines, the um, Arabs, the Persians, the Mongols, Tamerlane, uh, and the Russians, have all conquered and occupied um, these three countries um, over the course of millennia. And yet they all retain their individual identities and almost all display a very strong sense of nationalism. And part of that uh, is, is makes this um, an interesting and difficult place to deal with and work with if you're a diplomat or a foreign policy person because of um, the very, very strong national identities that we have. So how big are these places? Well, here if we picked up Iowa and dropped Iowa right into the South Caucasus, um, we'd see that, so Iowa has uh, about 56,000 square miles. Uh, the South Caucasus, uh, the three countries of the South Caucasus, about 71,000. So in terms of, um, if, if we think of Iowa having 99 counties, so the South Caucasus are about the same size as if there were 125 Iowa counties, right? Three million Iowans, uh, three million people live in Armenia, uh, about 10 million in Azerbaijan, and four or five million in Georgia. And so Armenia, which is only about the size of 20 Iowa counties, has the same population as Iowa. So the, the, the countries are much more densely populated than, than Iowa is, um, but they're also a lot poorer. Um, Azerbaijan has lots of oil and natural gas. The other two countries don't have a lot of exploitable um, mineral or other natural resources besides farmland. Um, in terms of, um, of development, Georgia is the most developed. Uh, people who work in development, my friends who work for USAID and the World Bank, they use a measure called Human Development Index, which is a mixture of income and health and education standards. And if you add those three together and get this Human Development Index, or HDI, what development people talk about, Georgia is by far the most developed. And it's about the same level of development as the country of Serbia in the former Yugoslavia, whereas Armenia and Azerbaijan are, have a lower HDI, about the same level as that of Mexico. So kind of in the middle of the pack, Georgia's better off on, you know, on some of these standards than Armenia and Azerbaijan. And how about uh, their political development? So too, in political development, Georgia is the leader of the pack. Um, the, the NGO Freedom House ranks countries by level of uh, civil liberties and political rights. Um, Georgia and Armenia are, re are rated partly free. Georgia is slightly better than Armenia. Azerbaijan is, is way down there on the list. It's rated not free. It's at the same level of civil liberties and political rights as China, which is pretty low. Uh, nine out of 100 uh, is what Azerbaijan gets. So, um, so in levels of, of economic and human development, Georgia um, and following political development, uh, Georgia and Armenia are pretty close. Azerbaijan is way back, meaning it, uh, people in Azerbaijan have few civil liberties and political rights. So in Georgia and Armenia, there are contested elections. Azerbaijan has been run by a dynasty since the uh, end of the Soviet Union. Um, father passed down power to son. So that's kind of an overview. Um, and let's think about the countries around here. So the blue up there is Russia, a big country that has trade ties and uh, military ties to some of these three. Turkey right here, about 85 million people. 
golfing, uh, huge uh, uh, engulfing um, much of the former ter territory that was populated by Armenians before World War I. And down here is Iran. And let's think about the connections here in terms of uh, trade and business, um, lots of connections back and forth between the Caspian Sea and Central Asia over that way and the Black Sea and uh, Europe uh, to the left here. So in that way, uh, horizontally, the Trans-Caucasus, the South Caucasus region can be seen as kind of a bridge between Central Asia and Europe and north and south between Russia and uh, Turkey and Iran. There are also other links that we'll talk about in, in a minute. Uh, there's Iowa. So we'll talk, go first to the country of Armenia. Armenia, um, here's the capital, Yerevan. And the big mountain right behind that you can see from Yerevan is not in Armenia, it's in Turkey. And that big mountain is Mount Ararat. And, and if you look at uh, the book of Genesis, chapter 8, after the flood, where does Noah's big ship floating zoo come down? Mount Ararat. Is it this mountain? Some people think so. Most don't. Some people think so. So uh, it is the, uh, the national symbol of Armenia. Armenia feels that they have a special tie there. And... Um, Mount Ararat, with a tiny arc balanced at the very tip of Mount Ararat, is on Armenia's national seal. So uh, Armenians feel they long for Mount Ararat. They can see it from their capital, but it's in Turkey. And so lots of Armenians look wistfully at that part of Turkey because Mount Ararat is there. And it used to be where lots and lots of Armenian people lived um, in the past. So this connection with Mount Ararat and the sort of the traditional understanding of Noah's Ark has also is reinforced by Armenia's strong Christian roots. Armenians are proud in the, uh, to claim that they are the first Christian kingdom that even before Constantine the Great uh, converted to Christianity and Rome became Christian, Armenia was already a Christian country. And today, despite all these layers of invasions and occupations all over Armenia, so there's, oops, um, there's Jane and I just there and our grandson just for some scale. Um, this is a beautiful, beautiful old, old church. And all over Armenia, you see these uh, Armenian apostolic churches. The Armenian Christians are not uh, in, the Orthodox, in the Eastern Orthodox uh, camp of Christianity. They're in something called the Oriental Orthodox, which even sort of are older. So Armenia is proud to be the first Christian kingdom, and um, most Armenians uh, identify with the um, Armenian Apostolic Church. Um, another thing that unites most Armenians and gives them a sense of national identity and grievance is the genocide that the Ottoman Empire undertook against uh, Armenians in 1915. So here we see a group of, Armen of demonstrators using the anti-Holocaust uh, slogan, never again. And above it is 1915. But you'll notice the decimal point between the nine and the five, or between the one and the five. Uh, some Armenians claim that 1.5 million Armenians were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, Turkey denies that there was a Holocaust or a genocide against the Armenians. And if you use the term genocide in Turkey, you're in big trouble. Uh, they're complete genocide deniers. In fact, the guy that coined the term genocide, a Polish Jew named Rafael Limkin, uh, had studied the genocide against the Armenians by the Ottomans in 1915 when he was thinking about uh, the Holocaust and Hitler's final solution for jewelry in, in Europe and beyond. And so uh, it, the genocide against the Armenians was kind of the, the role model that uh, Raphael Lemkin uh, used when he was thinking of the term and the, uh, and the horrible mass killing of an entire people. And so Armenians uh, around the world um, are fervent, uh, supporters of the never again sentiment uh, about the 1915 genocide. So a lot of uh, Armenians escaped 
and some came to the United States. So the United States has about between four and 600,000 Armenians who identify very, very closely with uh, their homeland or their uh, ancestral homeland. And so one of Armenia's strongest tools to influence US foreign policy is the Armenian diaspora, largely concentrated in California. So anybody that runs for Congress or the Senate from California has to have the support of Armenian, uh, Armenian voters in California. So another, another uh, element in this story is the sacrifices that Armenia made as part of the Soviet Union in World War II. Here is a giant uh, Soviet-era war memorial um, in northern Armenia with our oldest son and me uh, at this memorial. But just behind this uh, World War II memorial is a modern military cemetery. You can see the uh, Armenian flags here. We walk back there, and these were young men, uh, uh, 20-year-olds, who had died in the horrible war with Azerbaijan in 2020. Um, in 2020, Azerbaijan uh, attacked um, uh, a disputed territory between uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Armenia suffered about 4,000 uh, killed in action. And for a country of 3 million, say the United States is over 300 million, so it would be the equivalent if the United States had lost 400,000 people killed in war. So like World War II numbers of dead uh, for uh, uh, Armenia in the 2020 war, which they lost badly uh, with Azerbaijan. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So, the Armenians not only are, are proud of their country, of their independence, um, their special character that they have as uh, the first Christian country, um, they also feel closely tied to other Armenians. And here we were coming out of a restaurant in, in some place and saw this just as graffiti stuck on a, a stairwell, actually. And it says, Free Artsakh. And Artsakh is the name that Armenians give to this um, exclave of a little island of uh, people, po uh, uh, island populated by Armenians inside Azerbaijan, which has been the bone of contention between Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia since 1988. So free Artsakh, uh, kind of, a, again, the Armenians look to support their brethren in this um, exclave. So moving on to the neighbor, Azerbaijan, this will tie us into Dynamite and the Nobel Peace Prize, among other things. Um, maybe you've seen the movie The World Is Not Enough, a uh, James Bond movie set in, in part in Baku about oil pipeline politics and terrorism and things. Well, this was Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan in the 1880s. This was a, an oil boom like the world had never seen. Now, there weren't internal combustion cars, so why did people want oil? Well, we were running out of whales, and whale oil had been a dominant form of lighting. But they were, whale, whale oil was being replaced by kerosene. And so uh, kerosene is a petroleum product. So people wanted oil to be able to um, refine kerosene out of it. And the people that went into Baku and found a lot of oil, and you can see how many oil wells there are, were a group of uh, Swedish brothers who were kind of capitalist entrepreneurs and uh, petroleum engineers, the Nobel brothers. So they went in and made a fortune in, uh, in the oil fields of Baku in the late 1800s. And uh, some people argue that they helped develop dynamite and made another fortune on dynamite to help in their oil exploration. And they used some of the money that they made from oil in Azerbaijan um, and the dynamite industry to give the Nobel Prizes. So the Nobel Peace Prize comes with a pretty reasonably sized check that may be the proceeds of the dynamite industry or this kind of oil industry in Azerbaijan. Sort of one, one of the world's little ironies so that we have the Nobel Peace Prize and the other prizes given out by the Nobel brothers from Azerbaijan. Um, so Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, so here we see Azerbaijan on the right, Armenia on the left. A little more about them. Uh, Azerbaijan 
has three times the size of population, three times the size of economy, three times the size of area than Armenia. So it was a surprise back in the late 1980s when Armenia and Azerbaijan began to fight over um, this area here, which we see, it says Artsakh here for those sitting close, which means that this is a sort of a, an Armenian map. Only Armenians call this area Artsakh. Um, during the Soviet times, it was called Nagorno-Karabakh. Karabakh means uh, black garden, and Nagorno means mountainous. So it's an area, kind of a mountainous plateau area here, populated by ethnic Armenians, but separated from Armenia by stretches of Azerbaijan. So there was an exclave of Armenia, Armenian speakers um, inside Azerbaijan during Soviet times. As the Soviet Union was coming apart at the seams, um, the people, the Armenians that lived in Nagorno-Karabakh said, we want to be part of Armenia. And so there was big fighting between um, Azerbaijan and Armenia and the Armenians who lived here in Nagorno-Karabakh. And the Armenians basically won. So all of this territory here was taken over by Armenian forces, those from Nagorno-Karabakh plus the Armenian army. And so from 19, when this war ended in 94, really, until 2020, um, Armenia controlled all of this territory and did um, complete ethnic cleansing. Anybody who was uh, Azerbaijani in these areas had to leave. And also it meant, you see Azerbaijan is here, but this is a little exclave of Azerbaijan here, part of the country of Azerbaijan. It borders Turkey and Iran and Armenia. So getting through here was a big issue for uh, Nachivan, this exclave over here. So from 1988 until, until 2020, um, Armenia had control um, of all of this territory. Nagorno-Karabakh had declared itself independent. Only two countries recognized it, uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which again, nobody recognized much. Uh, we'll talk about those in a minute. So 2020, a uh, big war. Be um, Azerbaijan, which had gotten rich during uh, high oil prices, and also the uh, Azerbaijan military uh, was very innovative and realized that air forces are expensive, training pilots are expensive, so they bought lots and lots of drones from Turkey and from Israel. And Azerbaijan really launched the era of drone warfare, which we've seen now play out on a much larger scale in um, Ukraine and, um, and Russia. But the Azeris used drones, Israeli drones and Turkish drones. Uh, Turkey sent some of their um, Syrian militia to help the uh, Azerbaijani army. And with Israeli and Turkish help, the Azerbaijanis just pounded uh, the Armenians. It was so bad that, uh, that they were afraid that the army was going to drive towards Yerevan. And so this, green, this, this color green here was not occupied by the Azerbaijan army at the end of this 44-day war, but in the peace treaty where Armenia had to sign uh, sort of this ceasefire agreement, it had to cede all of these areas. And it meant that Nagorno-Karabakh, which about a third of which had been occupied by the Azerbaijan army in this war. So the only way connecting Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh, the, the, the leftovers here, the Armenians that still lived here, was this little corridor called Lachin, or the Lachin Corridor, which at the end of the war, Russia said, we will have a peacekeeping uh, group here and we'll keep this corridor open. Um, and Russia also has a, um, an, a military base in Armenia. Armenia is a member of the Collective Security Treaty Organization, uh, an ally, military ally of Russia. Russia didn't do anything in 2020. Uh, last December, uh, Azerbaijan closed this corridor and in January completely closed it. They put a, a checkpoint here. So no food, no medicine, no fuel into Nagorno-Karabakh. There are about 120,000 Armenians there now. No food, no electricity, no fuel. So you'll see in the New York Times and elsewhere um, the growing humanitarian concerns about um, 
Azerbaijan basically starving out 120,000 Armenians in the remnant of Nagorno-Karabakh here. So Armenia is really upset. Russian, uh, Russian base here, treaty with Russia, Russian peacekeepers here who were rolled by the Azerbaijanis. So who does Armenia look to? Well, they buy weapons from Russia. They get their natural gas, most of their natural gas from Russia. But Russia now, and so to rearm, where are they going to get their weapons? Russia is using all of their weapons to fight um, Ukraine. So um, recently, Armenia has turned to India, which also had lots of Soviet weapons that it bought during the Cold War. So Armenia and India now are buddies. Another interesting thing is that Iran and Armenia have grown very close. Um, Russia and Iran cooperate in Turkey to support the dictator there. Iran has just recently sent uh, thousands and uh, uh, thousands of drones to, uh, to Russia and has built a drone factory in Russia to use against Ukraine. So Russia, Iran, uh, and India are supporting Armenia, while Azerbaijan is supported by Turkey, which is its neighbor. There's just a little tiny slice of Turkey here. Um, Azerbaijan, Azeri is very, very similar to Turkish. Uh, both Azerbaijan and Turkey are Muslim countries, but Azerbaijan is Shia Muslim, like the majority of people in Iran. So Azerbaijan has been surprisingly close allies with Israel. You'd think that Israel and Armenia, both being the victims of genocide, would kind of have some sympathy. But no, Israel supports Azerbaijan because Azerbaijan pumps its oil from Baku up through Georgia, through Turkey, and provides the largest, uh, Azerbaijan is the largest provider of oil to Israel. And in return, Azerbaijan is the largest purchaser of Israeli weapons exports. So Azerbaijan has spent billions of dollars on Israeli weapons and has recently signed a multi-million dollar contract to have Israel launch two satellites for it. Um, why is Israel interested besides getting oil and selling weapons? Um, about 15% of Iranians are Azeri speakers. Everybody who lives in the northern part of Iran is Azeri. And if Israel was going to bomb uh, Iran's nuclear plants, they might, um, they might need to land the, their aircraft in Azerbaijan after bombing the uh, Iranian nuclear facilities. And sabotage from, uh, of those facilities, which has happened uh, regularly over the last eight or nine years, some people suspect Iran has accused Azerba Azerbaijan of cooperating with Mossad in some of the sabotage of uh, Iranian nuclear facilities. So for Israel, um, being uh, an ally of Azerbaijan makes some sense. It gives them access to Iran, uh, w weapons sales, and oil uh, purchasing for Azerbaijan. So it's to see India and Russia and Iran on the same side and Turkey and Israel supporting the Shia Muslim Turkish speaking country, it's crazy. We would never have, 1983, nobody would have thought anything like this could happen, um, let alone in Georgia. Here's Georgia. Uh, in 2008, Russia invaded Georgia. Um, during the breakup of the Soviet Union, two ethnically separate spots kind of declared their independence. Russia in 2008 uh, came in to support them and went further. The Russians got about right on the outskirts of Tbilisi when two things happened. Well, they stopped and went back, but two things happened. One was, did they run out of gas? Maybe their logistics weren't very good. We saw the Russian column stop before it got to Kyiv uh, last year. And also, uh, they stopped when the U.S. began to airlift the special forces of Georgia back from Iraq. Uh, there, were, um, there were the best units of the Georgian army were supporting the U.S. and NATO fighting in Iraq. There were also uh, hundreds of Georgian troops fighting in Afghanistan when President Biden ordered America to pull out of Afghanistan in 2021. So Georgia has been, has, had worked very closely with the U.S. Um, and is that why Russia stopped uh, in its drive to Tbilisi? Nobody knows for sure. Uh, so think about Abkhazia and South Ossetia, self-declared independent countries, recognized by Nicaragua, 
Venezuela, Syria, and Belarus, uh, oddly. So one of the things that keeps Georgian identity strong is their language, which is unlike any other language in the world. And also, they have their own unique script. So can anybody here read this? <laughs> Boy, I can't even tell where the words end, kind of. It's just, uh, it's very, very difficult um, script. Another thing is their religion. Here's a, a Orthodox priest. And you can see here this strange-shaped cross. This is the cross of St. Nino. St. Nino was a woman who came in the 300s to Georgia, uh, having had a vision of uh, meeting the Virgin Mary, and um, she brought this kind of cross with a, a drooping crossbar to Georgia. Most Georgians are members of the Georgian Orthodox Church. Um, and the, again, all over Georgia, beautiful churches with stonework. And the monks, as layer after layer of the invader came, wave after wave, Many of the monks uh, took some of the relics and built um, sort of stone cities. So here is a famous uh, former monastery built into the cliffs in Vardsia in Georgia to be able to defend themselves against uh, all the invaders that came. Here's, this is kind of blurry, but this column is in a church um, that claims to have buried underneath the, the relic that was Jesus' robe. There's a famous movie called The Robe about this sort of seamless robe that Jesus, by legend, was wearing at the time of his crucifixion. Somehow, uh, an early Georgian Christian bought it from the Roman centurion who had it, who won it gambling, and it happens to be buried underneath here. Uh, the priest came up and, and asked where I was from. I said, uh, United States. And he said, Travis City, Missouri, or Michigan? And I said, no. And he took a little paintbrush and painted a, using holy water, painted a cross on my forehead. Kind of strange. So the robe uh, underneath this church. Again, St. George. Georgia is not named after St. George, but St. George slaying the dragon here. This is a famous column in downtown Tbilisi, the capital. Stalin is a famous Georgian. People say that converts make the strongest uh, advocates. So, you know, Napoleon was a Corsican. Uh, Franco was Galician. Stalin was Georgian. Um, and here's a little a small town uh, World War II memorial with all the young men from their town who died and Joe Stalin up here overseeing them all. Can't imagine a war memorial in Europe, in Germany, with Hitler's picture still on it, but uh, there he is. Um, a park in his hometown, uh, it's kind of a museum, an open air museum. This is the house that Stalin grew up in. This is his train car that he took to Yalta, his armored train car, when he was meeting uh, Western leaders, um, again, part of this museum. So Stalin still has some, some profile in Georgia. Here, Stalin used to come to this uh, spa sanatorium that had slightly radioactive water for health treatments. It was trashed in civil unrest in the early 90s. And now it's just kind of open. Jane and I gave ourselves a self-guided tour here. Um, and it's just amazing. And so the Soviet elite and Stalin used to come down here for two-week spa resort vacation at the sanitarium in Georgia. Um, here is a Soviet-era hangar at a, uh, an air base, so big um, metal doors that could withstand bomb blasts. Um, and these um, hangars here, earthen hangars, there's our family up there visiting. Um, here's an old MiG out in the middle of nowhere. During the 2008 invasion, uh, the um, Georgians put telephone poles up and down the runway so the, Soviets, so the Russians couldn't land aircraft, um, airlifted troops into this western part or eastern part of Georgia. So the Russian army, um, so up this way is Gori, Stalin's hometown. The Georgians were going to make their final stand at this little river town called Mishketa. Um, they were bringing units from all over the the group of airlifted uh, special forces that the US had just uh, returned from Iraq. We're going to meet here and have the final stand, last stand against the Russians. But they stopped and went home before they got to this town, so they didn't have to. Um, Georgia today is a combination of old and new, traditional sort of Russian-looking orientation and modern European or American Western-looking orientation. So here. Here's a, a, group of, oops, a group of people picking potatoes. Here's a, a horse a team here with a one-bottom plow turning over 
potatoes and mostly women on their knees picking potatoes, kind of old fashioned. Here is a lady um, in a mountain village collecting water at a public, probably to do her wash with her son, um, helping out or goofing around. Um, here's uh, some people in the town of Kutaisi. This could be any time in the last hundred years, uh, buying uh, sort of what they call farmer's cheese here from a, a stall just uh, on the side of the street. Um, and here's a mix of old and new. Here's the main road between uh, Georgia and Russia. It's called the military highway, lined with lots of trucks, but occasionally there's a cattle stampede on this as well. Um, and the Chinese, part of the uh, Belt and Road um, Initiative, here we see that all over Russia, excuse me, all over Georgia, whoops, um, going both east and west and north and south are uh, Chinese-built highways. So the Chinese are trying to make the links through Central Asia and South uh, Caucasus stronger and are working hard at it in Georgia. Modern Georgia is full of weird things like this. The, this looks like a fun house picture kind of, but this is downtown uh, Tbilisi, the neighborhood called Vake, where this building, I always walk fast when I walk under this building because it's leaning out really odd. This looks like it's left over from a tornado, but that's how they're supposed to be. Uh, Batumi on the Black Sea coast, uh, the previous uh, president uh, wanted to turn it into sort of the Las Vegas of the Black Sea. So it made this kind of Europe square. They, here's uh, Jason and the Golden Fleece up here and all kinds of, lots of people, lots of Turks come to gamble here in Batumi. Um, and so they see these strange architectures all over. It's really a fascinating, strange place to visit. Um, and even in small towns all over were kiosks. So here's a little kiosk that's selling Bitcoin and three or four other kinds of cryptocurrency. So a little short on Bitcoin, you think the market's gonna go up, pop into the kiosk and you can buy it. Also, there's no leash laws. There are a lot of uh, stray dogs that all have an ear clip that shows they've been fixed and have their rabies shots. And businesses will put out little dog houses and dog dishes for all the strays. So again, kind of, kind of a modern sense here, get your cryptocurrency uh, and, and scratch the ears of the stray dog. Here is a, a driver from, uh, a driver that was driving us from Batumi back to the capital. And we stopped to see this, looks like kind of a Greek helmet or something up here. Previously, the government of uh, uh, Mikhail Sashkashvili moved the parliament out in the middle of nowhere, out to this town called Kutaisi, he thought power was uh, concentrated in Tbilisi, he wanted parliament out here. So for about uh, 10 years, parliament met out here until he lost power and then the next gover government said, no, we're going back to the capital. But that's a really bizarre building out in the middle of nowhere. It'd be like suddenly announcing if President Biden said, oh, we're gonna build uh, uh, Capitol Hill in Topeka, Kansas, um, sort of, uh, didn't last long. And here again, the old and new, oops, um, here is a Soviet era this is in Bautumi, the, the port. Soviet era sort of uh, beach apartments down here for the Soviet Communist Party elite to come down and enjoy. Now decrepit, uh, falling apart. But right next to it, right in front of it, this space age looking McDonald's restaurant. <laughs> so we see the old Soviet uh, building here for the apparatchniks who exceeded their five year work plans. And right next to it, the space age McDonald's with electric scooters here. Shows you some of the the old and new, the tension. Uh, you know, if Georgia was on a tectonic plate, it would be splitting, doing the splits here. Part of the country, uh, the current government, quite accommodating to Russia, recently it had direct flights. Um, there are 100,000 Russian draft dodgers in, in Georgia now. So uh, it, it will be, it remain to be seen what Georgia will be like. The population, very anti-Russian all over our Ukrainian flags at many of the apartment buildings, but the government is quite accommodating. So like, so here's an old uh, ballet theater in Tbilisi. And so like these dancers, uh, Georgia is going to have to be very, very balanced, I think, um, and to maintain its balance because you've got big expansionist Russia right next door and a population that's largely anti-Russian how the government manages to do this remains to be seen. Um, they do it by a series of uh, repressive measures. Uh, the previous president who made that weird 
Parliament building in Kutaisi. He's in prison and maybe being poisoned while he's in prison. He's kind of a strange character, but nevertheless, he's being mistreated. Um, so like these uh, statues of ballet dancers, Georgia will have to be um, very balanced and very artful uh, in the coming years because I'd say the situation between the, the Western Pole and the Russian Pole makes Georgia quite precarious. So with that, I think I'll just end. So we've seen all these strange connections in the South Caucasus that leave us maybe as confused as when I started about two minus one equals what? Uh, some very, very unusual things that 40 years ago, as ICFRC was starting, we would never have said, in 40 years, we're going to be talking about India and Iran and Russia helping Armenia and Israel and Turkey helping. So anyway, um, I don't have any answers. I just wanted to raise some questions and, and show you a place where all of the sort of current confusion about world order is playing out on a very small scale. So thank you very much. Uh, appreciate your time and attention. Okay, is this, am I, uh, yes, I'm audible through this, good. Okay, we now move to the question and answer portion of our program. Um, for those here in the audience, uh, please raise your hand if you have a question. I will come to you with the microphone. Um, I do want to take this uh, special occasion, I thought of the right moment to do it, uh, to thank uh, Carrie Norton uh, through the D. Norton Fund for providing all the wonderful food today. So please, if we could give her a round. And I brought with me also uh, two different items. So the first five people that ask questions I have two uh, ICFRC uh, t-shirts, size large, just, you know, uh, so you know, size large, okay? So they're size large. Uh, and I have here uh, three of the very highly coveted ICFRC mugs that you've seen in past programs. So you may choose uh, the first five folks to ask questions whether you like a t-shirt or one of our very coveted mugs, uh, also honoring uh, the past and the present here also, and uh, Dee Norton and Carrie Norton's contributions to our wonderful organization. Um, I'm sure there are questions in the room for Ambassador McMullen. Yes, would you like a mug or a t-shirt? Oh, well, okay. Let me come to you with the microphone so that it's audible. We're also recording. Uh, so this helps us make sure that uh, the recording is sound. That's a fair deal. Um, this is a really, really enlightening presentation. Um, what surprised you the most when you were up there in your travel? Um, Georgia, where you saw Ukrainian flags everywhere and lots of graffiti that was anti-Russian and pro-Ukrainian went in uh, one step across the border into Armenia, none of that. And so the, the view of Russia in Georgia from the population, very negative. In Armenia, Arme the Armenians had hoped that uh, Russia would save them from Azerbaijan and Turkey. Uh, Azerbaijan, uh, Armenia also is, is the large, one of the largest sanction busters uh, for Russia. The West has put all kinds of embargoes and sanctions on Russia. Armenia is the open back door to Russia. So in the last year, Armenian microchip exports to Russia have increased by 500%. So the West trying to strangle the Russian economy, uh, Armenia sees it as golden opportunity uh, to make a lot of money in a hurry. And so just going across the border suddenly not seeing Ukrainian flags or anti-Russian graffiti uh, was, was something that surprised me a lot. Yes. I'll take a cup. Cup, yes. <laughs> All right, very good. I like takers, nice, okay. Pardon me, Sunday. There you are, sir. And your question? I know Erdogan in Turkey is kind of a wild card because you, on any given day, you don't know which way he's going to go. How big an impact does he have on the stability or instability of the region? Yeah, good question. And I think uh, Erdogan has been uh, a, 
Oh, the question was, uh, what role does Turkey and its president Erdogan play in the region? Um, Erdogan has been a very strong backer of Azerbaijan, uh, provided not only uh, weapons, drones, Turkish drones to uh, Azerbaijan, but also sent, um, by some accounts, thousands of their Syrian mercenaries. Turkey has a buffer zone, has carved out a buffer zone in northern Syria uh, to keep the Kurds at bay there and have hired uh, Syrian Arabs um, as sort of mercenaries to maintain that buffer zone. And during the, the 2020 war, um, Turkey sent lots and lots of Syrian mercenaries to help lead the assault on the Armenian trenches um, around Nagorno-Karabakh. And maybe five or 600 Syrians died. And so that was going above and beyond, not just drone sales, but sending uh, their Syrian mercenaries to fight on the, to be the tip of the spear for the Azerbaijan army. So yeah, he's pe played a big role. Yes, see a hand. T-shirt or mug? Mug. All right, fabulous. They are coveted, so you got to get them while you can, okay? There you go, and the mic. I, I, I was just wondering uh, uh, if you could uh, clarify a little bit the uh, United States attitude toward all of these changes in territory and, uh, uh, and other sorts of things. Do we have a consistent attitude on defending, you know, original borders or, or what? The, the United States did not recognize Nagorno-Karabakh's independence claims. Um, the Armenian diaspora, particularly uh, its influence with the California uh, congressional delegation is very, very strong. So the United States has been friends with Armenia. Uh, we worked hard to get Azerbaijan to build a pipeline to take its oil from Baku to Tbilisi, then through Turkey and to the Mediterranean. Um, there are American companies that are involved in, in that uh, pipeline, as well as um, oil in the Caspian Sea in the area. Until the invasion of Ukraine, we had thought we had a very close relationship with Georgia. 20, in 2008, just before the war, uh, the United States joined NATO in saying that uh, Georgia will eventually become a NATO member. And Georgia had sent troops to Iraq and Afghanistan to fight alongside American troops there. Um, but recently, the accommodation that the ruling political party in Georgia, Georgian Dream, has made with Russia having direct flights, um, having visa-free travel, allowing all kinds of trade to go from Georgia into Russia, has made the United States, um, and we've also banned, uh, put visa bans on four judges. So we see the government now as being increasingly authoritarian and pro-Russian. And so our traditional pro-Georgian actions uh, have, have cooled somewhat as Georgia becomes more accommodationist to, to Russia. So the United States doesn't have a, a major role in the area compared to Turkey, Iran, and Russia. We do have interest. We promote human rights and democracy uh, traditionally, um, and those are under, under threat in Georgia right now, I'd say. Maybe two more questions for the ambassador. He's got to get to a meeting. Sunday, I need you a T-shirt or a mug. Excellent. <laughs> and your question. Thank you so much for that presentation. And um, I'm just going back to your two minus one. And um, uh, we, for now, we don't know what the equation actually equals. But I don't know if you can actually extend whatever is happening there now to um, a global context. What 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 do you think? For example, I'm 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 from Africa. I'm from Nigeria, and and I'm trying to look at as you're talking. I'm trying to see what is happening with uh, the the powers now, mm. and and I don't know if you can extend uh, yeah. whatever you you've seen here now yeah. to to what is happening in other parts of the so world. We've seen uh, an interesting development in Africa, particularly this last. 
12 months, uh, a contagion of coup d'etat, particularly in Francophone Africa. And in the past, uh, coup makers would suffer sanctions or uh, condemnation by the African Union, other countries, United States, um, maybe the UN. Um, and it hasn't happened. And it may be that, um, that the United States, particularly during the Trump administration, stopped talking about promoting democracy. I think we need to worry about it in our own country. Um, and so many people, and particularly China, said, oh, they, the United States promotes democracy and human rights. It's a form of racist imperialism uh, because it's Western values. It's not Chinese traditional Confucian values or East Asian values or world values. It's American values. And so when America talks about promoting democracy and human rights, then they're just racist imperialists, and you can ignore them. And this has caught on, particularly in some parts of Francophone Africa, where the French had a very strong presence after independence and seen as sort of uh, post-colonial patrons and bullies supporting corrupt governments that were stealing and not providing for their people. And so I think that this notion that um, China's rise and the uh, equating of uh, human rights and democracy as Western racist imperialism has loosened the prohibitions on coup d'etat in Francophone Africa and the ethnic cleansing um, and outright invasion of a neighboring country like we've seen Russia do. So I think that the, the standards are changing, in part specifically because of China's um, wolf warrior diplomacy, as they call it, where they're striking out against what we used to call universal values, promoting human rights, rule of law, and democracy. President Biden speaks about it more than President Trump. President Trump Never, never talked about it. Uh, President Biden only rarely because the Chinese are always there saying racist imperialists talking about human rights and, and, um, and democracy. So it's complicated and muddy. It adds to the confusion about the current world order. So good question, and um, yeah, it, it makes the situation muddier still. And for a final question, yes, in the back, T-shirt or mug? What's that? A mug. mug. Fabulous. OK. So I, I'm more interested in the um, young and the old that you showed in Georgia or something. So what's the perception of the young uh, from what your observation? Because they are the ones that are really going to push this forward. Where are, gonna, are they going to lean to? Are they going to lean to the West? or to Russia, or they're going to find a new ground, maybe towards China. Because that's what's happening in Africa right now. So yeah. what's, are you, what's your observation in Georgia? So we met uh, a lot of people when we were traveling in the region. Our, again, our son teaches at an international high school there, and so does our daughter-in-law. And um, So we, we met some people. And when we said we were from the US, they said, where? Uh, we said Iowa, which didn't resonate. And, so many, so many Georgians said, I'd like to emigrate to California. They wanted to go to California. Um, California has beaches and snow-capped mountains like Georgia. Um, so a lot of the uh, uh, elementary school teacher in Georgia, in a Georgian pu public school, uh, makes about $350 a month, which is hard, hard to raise a family on that. Uh, college, ed, uh, college lecture makes about $600 a month. So if Georgia can't somehow get its economy growing faster, um, I think a lot of the young people look to Europe and the US as a spot for a better life. And so it's incumbent upon the government now to create opportunities, not to steal all the money for their own cronies, but to provide opportunities to open the economy such that it will grow and provide opportunities for young people who want to stay and help build their country to be stronger. But if they don't, then there's lots of opportunity to go to Europe and to emigrate to the United States and elsewhere. And Georgia is going to lose the, the best minds of the upcoming generation if they're only going to pay $600 for it. My pay is not very much at the University of Iowa, but it's a lot more than $600 a month. 
So, so the economy, I think, will decide where young people decide to stay or go. Um, thank you very much uh, to Ambassador McMullen for today's excellent program. Uh, just a quick uh, couple of final notes. Um, if you would like to support our wonderful programs, uh, please do uh, make a gift online at icfrc.org. You can check out one of the signs around or talk to one of our amazing board members. I also want to tell you about uh, our upcoming program. Uh, this was our second program of the fall. Uh, we were honored uh, to host an Ukrainian speaker just a couple weeks ago, Oksana Herchak. Our next program features Dr. Nana Mellum from the uni uh, American University of Beirut, and that is next week, Wednesday, right here in this very room. As a part of her broader visit to the University of Iowa, she will be talking with us about cholera in Lebanon, an old disease with a new comeback. With that, Thank you all very much, sincerely, for attending today, and we are adjourned. <laughs>